The Everyday Struggles of Palestinian Life, that's the subject of the new book by Ben Ehrenreich. He spent most of the last three years in the West Bank living with Palestinian families in villages and in cities. He's an award-winning writer whose work has appeared in Harper's, The New York Times Magazine, and The London Review of Books, among other publications. He's also written two novels. His new book is titled The Way to the Spring, Life and Death in Palestine. Ben Ehrenreich, welcome to the program. Thanks, John. It's good to be here. And we're also joined by Amy Willens. She's a longtime contributing editor at The Nation and a veteran of this show. She also worked as Jerusalem correspondent for The New Yorker and wrote an unforgettable novel about life on the West Bank. It's called Martyr's Crossing. Amy, welcome back. Thanks, John. Ben, to uh, understand Palestinian life today, you lived in a West Bank village, Nabi Saleh. How, how did you pick that one? Um, well, I never lived there for more than a few weeks. When I lived there, I lived in Ramallah, but I spent a fair amount of time there, even when I wasn't living there. And I first went to Palestine as a reporter in 2011 on an assignment for Harper's Magazine to write about the role of water in the occupation. And I had heard about Nabi Saleh because in Nabi Saleh, like a bunch of other villages in the West Bank at the time, they were having weekly protests every Friday. Most of the villages um, that did that were on the course of the wall and were protesting the confiscation of their land in the construction of the wall. But Nabi Saleh was protesting the confiscation of a spring, just a, a water spring, by settlers who lived across the valley in a settlement called Halamish. And I spent... I went one day for the demonstration a Friday, um, and in those days the demonstrations would last many hours. What fascinated me about Nabi Saleh was that that by resisting, um, by staging these protests every Friday, they were bringing upon themselves like extraordinary suffering. Um, you know, every every Friday during the protest, they were risking their lives, risking their families' lives, um, because the soldiers would invariably um, come at them very hard um, with, you know, with tear gas, sometimes with live fire, with, with various other forms of munitions. And they would come back during the week, and they would raid people's homes in the middle of the night, and they would arrest people, they would arrest people's children, they would trash their houses. So they were sort of inviting into their lives extraordinary oppression. And all they had to do to kind of reduce it to the, the baseline humiliation that people suffer elsewhere in the West Bank was to stop protesting every Friday. And that they did not do and would not do. And I was interested in, in what it takes to, to keep struggling against a force that's impossibly more powerful than you are, and to keep going back knowing that in any kind of concrete way you can't win, um, that they were not going to topple the occupation all by themselves, um, but they were willing to, to, to take on all these sacrifices to, um, to keep fighting. And, and it was that that, that that fascinated me and kept me going back there. What interested me about Nabi Saleh was the basically unarmed resistance. Because when I was living in Jerusalem, uh, there was certainly armed resistance during the years of Oslo. I was there from 1995, basically all the way through 19, the beginning of 1999, and it was an era of bus bombings and suicide bombings. So for me to read all about this ongoing, basically to my mind, obviously the Israelis feel something other happening, this peaceful resistance was inspiring but I wondered to myself, as I read today a list of all the Israelis killed during the uh, during the Second Intifada uh, by uh, Palestinian violence, I wondered to myself whether, you know, the wall, which is such a hateful symbol and a repugnant Kafka-like edifice, hasn't actually forced the Palestinians into this kind of behavior, rather than, you know, having them be on the other side capable of more violent, dramatic actions. No, I think, you know, because the, the, the first of these um, unarmed demonstrations took place in villages along the path of the wall. First in, in places like, uh, places that lost, like places like Bidu, um, then in a, a village called Budrus, which actually right. won and, and was able to get the wall moved. And they continue in places like Bilin and, and Nialin. So before the wall was built, when the wall was being built, and while suicide bombs were going into Israel, and while there was, you know, real combat throughout the West Bank, um, in the cities and in the villages, people in these villages decided that that wasn't the, the tactic they were going to use. They were going to try something 
something different that they thought would be more effective. And, you know, I think um, it's also, if, if the horrible events of the last six, seven months have made anything clear, it's that the wall does not prevent violence. You know, right. that, that, uh, that, you know, people have been going into Israel and attacking Israeli civilians despite the wall, um, and the wall didn't stop them at all. Your first chapter is titled Life is Beautiful. Uh, almost everything that happens in this chapter is terrible. So who said life is beautiful and what did they mean? A little boy who at the time I think was five or six named Salam uh, Tamimi, um, who was the youngest son um, of the family that I was staying with. I'm trying to remember the exact circumstances in which he said that. I think we were all sitting around outside the house one evening and discussing the, the horrors of the day. Um, and Salam just announced, my name is Salam, which of course means peace. Um, and life is beautiful, you know, in this, with this uh, force that only a six-year-old can bring to a declaration like that. And, it, you know, it struck me that he was right. And I, and I think that that was something that I wanted to make sure was clear throughout this book, which is a book about really sad and heartbreaking and off, often really awful things happening um, in this really protracted way. That despite that, you know, people love one another and people love their lives and um, and find beauty in their lives and find beauty in each other. And I mean, that was certainly a constant for me while I was there. And and I wanted to make sure that that readers felt that too. The people who march to the spring are not just Palestinian villagers. There are some international solidarity activists, and there are some Israelis. There's one named Jonathan Pollock. Tell us about Jonathan Pollock. Jonathan is an interesting guy. He was one of the founders of a group called Anarchists Against the Wall that from the very beginning, the very early days, I think they started in 2002, it might have been 2003, um, but from the, the very earliest days of the construction of the wall, um, a small group of Israelis, Jonathan among them, started uh, going to Palestinian villages and offering their solidarity and, and offering you know, their, their presence um, in whatever way it could, could be helpful to those, those struggles. And Jonathan, all these years later, now, you know, more than a decade later, you can count on it on almost every Friday, you'll find him in Nabi Saleh. There are, there are others who do this as well. Jonathan has been arrested, I think, more than, more than 50 times. I think I've certainly seen him arrested at least half a dozen times, if not more. That alone, I think, is, is, is instructive in that Jonathan has, he's arrested and he's let go. Once, I think, he was sentenced to about a month in, in prison. Um, whereas, of course, if a Palestinian is arrested under the same circumstances, they are not, they're generally not released the same day. And, you know, they're tried under a completely different military court system, which uh, holds on to them for considerably longer and treats them with considerably fewer rights. Basim, your friend and the central figure in the protests at the spring, talked uh, briefly about suicide bombings. Of course, America, what Americans know about the Palestinian struggle is mostly the reports in the mainstream media of suicide bombings. He called suicide bombings the big mistake. What, what did he mean? What was he talking about? He meant that, I think in a, probably in more complicated ways than I'm going to um, make clear, that they were an enormous tactical mistake. That, and the great cost of suicide bombings was exactly what you say, that, that after the years of the First Intifada, when Palestine was able to project this international image that sort of corrected um, a lot of the kind of spectacular terrorism of the 1970s and the, and the early 80s, that after the First Intifada, the image of pa the Palestinian struggle abroad was of kids throwing rocks at tanks. Um, it was of an unarmed resistance against a much more powerful enemy. And that all of that was sacrificed by suicide bombs. That that, that was that was that sort of disappeared in the consciousness of the international community, and people instead understood Palestinian struggle in terms of terrorism, in terms of attacks on civilians, et cetera, et cetera. And that this was a, this was a huge setback, and one of the things that, that he was trying to hoping to correct through the kind of unarmed resistance that Nabi Saleh was offering was another vision of what it might mean to resist, not just for other Palestinians, but for the world. But wasn't his family, in fact, the, the broad Tamimi family, involved in a lot of uh, quite violent actions against Israelis? I'm thinking of the attack in which possibly he participated and was arrested for, but his cousin Nizar was arrested for, the attack on Haim Mitzrahi, in which the guy was basically knifed to death. 
uh, and it was a political action. And also Ahlam Tamimi, another, I assume, cousin or distant relation of, of Bassam's, who was the woman, young woman, uh, who uh, selected the Sabaro Pizza uh, outlet in Jerusalem as a target for a suicide bombing, brought the suicide bomber there, instructed him to stay for 15 minutes, have his pizza, and then blow himself up. You know, what you say in the book about how, her... How many people were killed at Sparrow? Fifteen people. Eight of them, arguably, children, if you count down from the age of 18. And what you say about her in the book is her relatives in Nabi Saleh still speak of her with great affection. She was released in the exchange for uh, Gilad Shalit. So, you know, he may say it was a bad, big mistake, but isn't the Tamimi family somehow, weren't they complicit in the whole action? Yeah, you know, I think the, the Tamimi family, like like most Palestinian families in the West Bank or in Gaza, you'd be hard-pressed to find a Palestinian family that doesn't have strong ties to the military resistance, um, to, to armed resistance, whether that's suicide bombs or the kind of attack that Bassam's cousins, three cousins, were convicted in, um, and which Bassam was originally charged in, on Hayam Mizrahi that resulted in his death. No one, no one disowns this violence. And... You know, what, what Bassam, the way he always articulated to me was, like, we have a right to resist. Um, we're people under occupation. We have a right to resist with whatever means are at our disposal. Under international law, we have a right to resist. He feels that they tried a military route. It failed. It lost them a great deal of international standing. It is impossible for Palestinians with the limited resources available to them to pose any real threat to the Israeli army. And therefore, they had to try something else. But but people there don't disown those acts, you know, in much the same way that I think uh, a lot of Israeli families would would not be willing to admit that they're ashamed of of family members for for being members of the IDF and taking part in um, in the Gaza attacks, in the Gaza attacks, or in you know in, in many other things. I'm completely upfront in the book about you know I don't hide these 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 incidents, but you don't feature them either. I don't feature them either, and the reason is that I think. To get too um, caught up in them means suggesting, which I'm not willing to do, that some people have a right to violence and other people do not. Um, and I think that's, when, when I would talk about it with Bassam, that's what, what he would end up saying. You know, nobody asks the Israelis to give up their right to violence. Nobody asks the Israelis to, you know, to put down their weapons and no longer engage in violence. Um, and but Palestinians are expected to disown violence, to to refuse it, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I th I think this is problematic. Um, that you know we call certain things terrorism, and we call other things you know sort of legitimate state violence. I agree with you, but I looked at Ahlam Tamimi, and you know when she's talking about at leaving Sabaros after the bomb went off, and she says, oh, at first I heard we had killed three, and no one on the bus knew that I was the one who was responsible, but I was so excited. And then when I heard it was 12, that was even better, and everyone was clapping. You get the feeling, of course, that these people need to express their extreme unhappiness. But there's a, an element of gloating that you wish... I, We're I mean, not so uncomfortable and horrible in a young woman like her who's obviously bright and, you know, would have been wonderful in another setting. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, there's a lot of extremely ugly emotions on, on, on all sides of this, and, and um, I certainly wouldn't try to hide that. I also don't want to, you know, minimize, like, the real suffering and pain that, that suicide bombing has caused in Israel. I don't go into that in any great depth because... That's I, not what the book is about. That's not what the book is about. And I think any American who's read anything about this topic at all has probably read a lot about the suffering that Israel's have, uh, the Israelis have endured because of suicide bombings. And they don't need it from me again. Um, and I don't think I need to touch that base. And I don't think people should be required to touch that base if they're going to talk about this conflict. Well, we're just about out of time here. The big question that brought you to this book and that we need the answer to is, <laughs> What makes it possible for these people to keep fighting against such tremendous odds? I mean, in a way, the book is a, is a 400-page answer to that question. Um, so it's hard to summarize it. But yes. I think um, from, from a great distance, 
occupation looks miserable and 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 we see the violence and whatnot. But one thing we don't see is the the horrific choices um, that this kind of violence puts before everybody. Um, these these impossible moral decisions, and one of them is is to resist or not to resist. If you resist, you you risk losing everything. You know, if you choose not to, you also will certainly lose a lot.